are so pleased to have you join us for this new and exciting series of webinars called Real Emergency, produced in partnership with Hantevi, RealDX, and 410 Medical. Real Emergency is powered by Prodigy EMS. I am Hillary Gates. I am the Director of Educational Strategy for Prodigy EMS. This webinar and the ones that follow will be available to you on our website, Prodigy EMS, and later on your favorite podcast platform. It will also be made available on the Real Emergency YouTube channel, as well as uh, on the Facebook channel of Real Emergency. Please like us on Facebook. We hope that you take advantage of these multiple opportunities to experience this awesome content. These three physicians speaking today, Mark Peel, Peter Antevi, and David Spiro, are all leaders in the pediatric field, and their experience covers the spectrum of pediatric care, from out of hospital to the emergency department to the ICU. More importantly, these guys are also educators at heart, and their number one goal is to educate healthcare providers in order to improve all patient outcomes. As we add to this series and make more episodes, know that Peter, David, and Mark's focus is on using real live video scenarios, innovation, and most importantly, solid evidence to achieve these goals. Let me briefly introduce our three speakers. David Spiro is a pediatric emergency physician and professor at the University of Arkansas Medical System. He felt so strongly about authentic education that he founded uh, co-founded RealDX, uh, wanting to get videos to the market of these real live patient cases. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina, and he served as medical director of the WakeMed Children's Hospital and the director of pediatrics at WakeMed Physician Practices from 2009 to 15. He has faculty appointments in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of North Carolina and Duke University. Dr. Peel is also co-founder, excuse me, is also founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical Innovation, a company focused on improving resuscitation in shock and sepsis. Finally, Peter Antevi is a pe pediatric emergency physician, EMS physician, and the founder of Pediatric Emergency Standards, the inventor of the Hantevi system. He serves as the medical director for numerous agencies in Florida and is also the lead pediatric EMS specialist for the highly influential Metropolitan EMS Medical Directors Coalition, also known as the Eagles. So let's get started with today's timely topic. We will be discussing multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, otherwise known as MISC, with provider captured video, and we'll also have a PALS guidelines discussion. So Mark, Peter, David, take it away. Hillary, thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am so excited for this. Um, we are getting a lot of people coming in. You probably wondered why we're all like in this Zoom room together. We all agree that you know, great education really uh, needs a lot of feedback. You're going to be hearing from some great people. Uh, obviously, you know, David is really what I think he pioneered this concept of live video um, in education. And when you see what we're, we're talking about here, not just in today's episode, but in future episodes, you'll understand like you feel like you're in the moment. So David, thank you for what you've done in the industry. Also- Honored here. Honored to be here with you, you and, and Mark, really. It's gonna be great. And then uh, Mark, obviously with his expertise in, not just as an ICU physician, but you know, he's in the field as well and he's an innovator as well. And so for all of you today on the call, uh, we had up the disclosure slide, and I think it's important that everyone understand here that we are educators. We want you to learn the real you know, information as we're going through it, but we also want you to understand that in medicine, there's always conflicts of interest. We want to be very clear here of our disclosure. So I'll start, and I'll let Mark and David go from there. So as Hillary mentioned, I am the founder and chief medical officer. Actually, the CEO is my wife, so let, let's be clear on that one. Uh, <laughs> that I am not CEO material, uh, but yeah, so those of you know that I, I did found a company called Hantevi. Mark, take it away. Hey, Peter, thank you. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. It's exciting. Um, yeah, I'm founder, or co actually co-founder and CMO of 410 Medical, which makes the life flow. And our intent with this series is to highlight, as Hillary mentioned, first, education, like excellent education mm -hmm. using real live patient video where we can find it, but also highlight innovations that, that help improve care. 
Um, our, our intent is not to first highlight our own things, although we will mention them at some point, but we want to bring in a variety of innovators in the field of emergency medicine for the hospital care as we go. So um, there you have my disclosure, David. And I'm the founder and CMO of, of RealDX. Uh, and the, the, the entire idea of RealDX is that uh, PowerPoints are, are challenging and uh, it's a great opportunity uh, when we can with informed patient consent to use real patient video as a medium to learn for learners. And uh, I guess the one point I wanna make is I started my medical, medical career as an EMT, as a paramedic, and I love working with EMTs and paramedics. I know Peter and Mark, Mark do as well. And uh, I'm honored actually to be here with these guys and to be working with you all. And we want this to be very interactive. So as we continue to go, we want you to raise your hand, uh, uh, chime in. We, that kind of interactivity will create uh, an organic sense of interactive learning using this content. So thank you for coming today. Uh, thanks, David. There, there's a, a couple of things that, that are, should, are very important here. Number one is, is that these videos are, you know, real people. And so um, any video that we show will have the express consent of the family. And I know David has based his entire company on, on that ethical, um, you know, concept, number one. Um, I, I do want to expressly thank Prodigy and James DiClemente, who is actually behind the scenes here today. Now, he's really in front of the scenes, but... Um, Prodigy EMS is an amazing, you know, platform and you'll see today that what we produce today will end up being, you know, more highly produced and put out on all the channels because we really hope that you take this information and that you spread it. Really, it just spreading the wealth is the key here. Um, Mark also was able to get today's video from a physician and Mark, you want to talk about that real quick? Sure, yeah, go? we're going to go to, uh, next, as Hillary mentioned, we're going to talk about um, the complication of COVID known as multi-system inflammatory disease in children, MISC. It's a condition though that teaches us a lot about just the management of sick children and sick adults for that matter in general, particularly in the approach to shock resuscitation. And so um, we'll go through what MISC is, how we think about it, how we think about hypotension and resuscitation. But I wanna give great credit and thanks to Larry Mellick who is uh, Chief of Emergency Medicine down at University of South Alabama. And he, check out his uh, website when you have, when his YouTube channel, when you have a chance, it's Larry Mellick, you can Google him. There's hundreds of cool, uh, freely available uh, YouTube videos on procedures and conditions that he's filmed in the ER, again, with patient consent, which we have um, been graciously given for this uh, video as well. So yeah, thanks for, thanks Larry for uh, helping us out there. Awesome. And I uh, yeah, appreciate that, Larry, for that. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that you're probably viewing this from uh, very different viewpoints, meaning that you could be an EMS professional, you may be a nurse, you may be a physician, you may be someone who's none of those. So we're going to try and kind of help everyone go through this case. And we want you to feel this case from your perspective, right? Because Mark's viewpoint, David's viewpoint, my viewpoint, are very different viewpoints. And so throughout this talk today, each of us will try and sprinkle in some of the key concepts from our point of view so that you're getting as much out of this um, as we are. And I can tell you that just in preparation for this conversation, it's been like, you know, it's really been an eye opener for me because of the video. So um, let's go ahead and get started and let's take it away. This child's 14 arrives to the ED ill appearing, uh, a little bit confused, alter mental status, and hypotensive, they want you laying as you can flat. see on the monitor here. So we're just going to start with this, setting up the for? scene. We got a sick kid. Could be in the ambulance, could be in the ED. And I'll, I'll run through with you <clears throat> what's happening here. So this kid, um, 14 years old, has had five days of fever. He's got a bunch of symptoms, sore throat, a rash everywhere, belly pain is prominent, and some nausea. And this was early in COVID. He did a uh, televisit uh, with his PCP. We thought maybe it's strep throat. Let's try out some uh, antibiotics. It was like 120. See what happens. Okay, so it's, remember this okay, is so May 2020. Come down. Go to the next. The uh, vaccination slide. is actually. Mark, yeah. Let me figure, just, it just let's go back one slide because I, I, um, I want to pause there for yep. for a good discussion. Um, thanks, thanks, James. Okay, so. 
here, here we have what you're saying is that that first vi that first video you just teased us with yep. is now when the kids now in the ED not doing well. Correct. But we're we're now backing it up five days when this kid first presented, and you're telling me here that, um, and now we're in COVID times that his mom went on and got a telehealth visit with a P with a PCP. Correct. Right. And so um, we, we could probably have a whole conversation in and of itself right there. Um, but that's the way of the world, right? And based on the, 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 the presentation that he got on a video visit, this kind of looked and felt like strep throat. And, and so for those people who seen these medications at the bottom, that's kind of some type of medication that you could prescribe for strep throat. That's the antibiotic that would cover group A strep, correct? That's right. It's one of them. It's yeah. Right. It's one of them. Correct. All right. Perfect. All right, James. So let's just go to one day prior to, to getting into the ED. He then gets a rash everywhere, red eyes, um, and goes to another, goes to an actual ED this time. And again, diagnosed with a viral illness and maybe a reaction to that septonere. So, so this cephalosporin is known to cause rashes. Um, and so maybe that's a reaction to, to the antibiotic. Bunch of labs done some viral studies. He doesn't have mono. Um, all looks okay. He's a little dehydrated, gets some fluids and is sent home. No known COVID exposure at that time. And he's uh, a COVID test is obtained and sent, though there wasn't a rapid, as I understand, at that moment. Um, so um, wait, hold on, hold on. Let me go back a little bit because I want to I want to poke on David for a second. So David, you're you're in the ED, and and you get a kid here who has a quote unquote rash to Omnicef or Ceftonir. Um, you know, and again, I've been in this situation where. Um, I, can, I probably need more than two hands to count the number of times that I, that I missed a diagnosis. Yep. Um, so obviously this kid came to the emergency department, had all these symptoms and was kind of told that he had a rash to what are you, What are your thoughts on that from, a, from the emergency department view, viewpoint? Well, one thing what we teach is not to, to avoid an anchoring error. Paramedics do it, uh, physicians do it, and I've done it. It's when you make a diagnosis or think about something and exclude other things. And I think physicians and, and early learners, uh, nurses, paramedics, we all get into this where we think it's one thing and then we avoid thinking about what else it could be. And um, I think it's important with rashes. Rashes can be caused by so many different things. So I think it's important when a child presents with a rash to just open up your mind and think about what, what the possibilities uh, could be around the rash. And uh, the other important teaching point that I continue to learn about as myself, as I, I continue to learn in medicine is the history tells you everything. So it's very important to get a very detailed and accurate history of what's going on. Uh, and that will also help you expand your, your, your differential diagnosis. So, so let me ask you a question then, because the strep in this, in this particular time was negative in the emergency department. Do you think that the emergency department physician was saying he already had a dose of, of ceftonir the day before my strep is negative. All of my labs are negative. The kid needed IV fluids. You know, here is where, and again, I'm going to blame myself. I've, I've made this mistake more times than I want to admit where you have a kid who has fever undifferentiated, it looks well, we did labs, and we still send the kid home. And then we come in the next day to the emergency department and say, hey, Pete, remember that kid you saw yesterday? I hate that, I hate <laughs> yeah. that. Right, so, okay, Mark, I'll throw it back to you so now we can see now he's, yeah. how, how he presents in the emergency department to lab. And then he's getting worse, comes back to um, the children's ED this time, and he's weak. He's has some nausea and some vomiting, maybe a little diarrhea, can't eat. He's actually short of breath. He looks ill, tired, breathing fast, rash everywhere, conjunctivitis, and you see his vitals. So decent fever. Interesting, tachycardic to 135. Bookmark that one. He's tachypnic. So breathing 28 a minute at age 14 is too fast. His blood pressure seems okay. Uh, it's probably not as normal, but it doesn't look too scary. And he's about 82, 82 kilos. So James, let's zip to just seeing the rash. Actually, before we do that, yeah. I, I'm just curious for, with any of our um, uh, attendees, 
what you all think of those vital signs. Yeah, uh, good. I, I used to work as a general pediatrician before I went into pediatric emergency medicine. And I think for many years I ignored vital signs or I didn't pay as much attention to them. And uh, children's vital signs are a bit different than adult vital signs. We think of them differently and uh, children are not just little uh, adults. So what do you all think about this? These vital signs, you know, can we explain the heart rate based upon the fever? Uh, do we rely upon that? Uh, Mark, what do you think is a critical care physician? Yeah, what do you think it's about such a good problem? question. So I, I'm seeing a ton of, of, I love this. I'm seeing a ton of interesting uh, thoughts and questions come in. There's, here's one that says, look like he's about to crash. So someone is perceptive there that this is not all normal. Okay, okay so, Mar so Mark, I, I have another question for you and for the yeah. crowd. You have here on the slide short of breath and yep. you have a respiratory rate of 28. Right. It, so I don't see anywhere in here that it says the word cough, right? Nope. So is, is this really shortness of breath? I wonder. Exactly. So let's go through first the heart rate question. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to jump way ahead and tell you heart rate is the most important vital sign to start with. And we often are tempted, particularly with kids, to say, oh, well, it's just a fever or they're scared or mom's not here and the kid's agitated or we've given albuterol so the heart rate's fast. But that, and those may be all true, but what if it's not? What if the the, the tachycardia reflects the need for increased cardiac output because there's something else wrong. And so your next clue is tachypnea may not be anything to do with, with uh, respiratory disease. It may be a reflection of acidosis and blowing off excess CO2, which is why our end tidal CO2, which wasn't available in this case, is often a marker of sepsis. So a low end tidal reflects the fact that we are trying to, trying to breathe fast to normalize our pH by blowing off CO2. So tachypnea alone is, a, is an indicator. And then the 95 over 55, someone just typed rightly in, hypotension in kids is age plus twice, is 70 plus twice their age. And I'll show you that on a slide in a minute. Usually over age 10, we say a minimum systolic of 90, just like we would in an adult. So I don't immediately see 95 here and say, this kid's about to crash. But when you put everything else together, plus altered mental status, um, they all as a as a package say, there's something more than just a viral illness going on here. And, and Mark, Mark and David, I don't know if you guys do this, but my, because I've missed this tachycardia, I've attributed it to all these things, the crying and the nurses and the doctors and everyone's making the kid upset. What, what I've done now many times in my career is that we'll come in, we'll put the leads on the kid, we'll walk out, I'll close the curtain, close the light. And then in my emergency department, I have a window, I can see the monitor even from my desk, but I can look at it right from above the window and I'll walk out of the room and I'll watch that kid's heart rate over the next five minutes. Yep. And if that heart rate is stuck there and not coming down and the kid's not crying anymore, I have my answer. So that's kind of what I do as, uh, because I've missed it so many times. One I love it. sign here that concerns me the most in some ways, I want to understand why this patient is decipment. That's yep. what, that, that would be concerning to me of all of them. Uh, they're, they're, it is, they, they are concerning up front, but that would, that's one of them that is concerning to me. And it may be that the child is blowing off an acidosis. Yep. And I, a couple of folks have noted, I don't have an end title or a SAT here. I didn't have those available. The SATs ended up being, you'll see in a minute, initially fine. Um, and I think that was on a whiff of oxygen, one or two liters, they were a hundred. So we don't have meaningful hypoxia, hypoxemia at this point, uh, just for, for your info. But thanks for all the comments. I love seeing this stuff come in. All right. Any other thoughts there, Peter, before we go? No, I'm ready to see this kid's uh, physical exam. James, let's just take a quick look at the rash. So we have, it's not as apparent maybe on your screen, but kind of red, splotchy, blanching rash everywhere. Um, eyes, this is a key um, on that next one. So bloodshot eyes. Interestingly, with absence of any discharge, that's a that's a, a hallmark of Kawasaki's, and now something we know in MISC that you get you have inflammation everywhere, and a great place to see that is the vessels in the whites of your eyes. So this is a classic uh, appearance of someone who's sick in general, but certainly someone with MISC or Kawasaki's. And then swollen lips, swollen red tongue um, are also uh, pretty common. And, and so, and so, Mark, I have to say that um, 
whenever I miss a disease a diagnosis like this and then the kid comes back in and then we really turn on the exam light, you know, the big fluorescent light on top and you really take a look, you're like, oh my God, how did you miss that, right? Yep. So rashes are very hard sometimes to pick up, especially if it's a darker skinned individual. And so I would, uh, um, you know, kind of push upon everybody to make sure you have the right lighting and making sure you're looking. And then even the eyes sometimes, if it's if it's nighttime, it's in a dark area, dark house you may be in, um, you really want to take a look and make sure that you're looking to see, you know, are those eyes hyperemic? Because again, it's a microvascular inflammatory problem going on here. So I just wanted to uh, just mention those things. Yep. Um, James, why don't we just see that video, that first video again, and I'll comment on a few of the things people are sending in, which is, one, sustained tachycardia means okay. he's sick, and that's true. Be watching that heart rate. Um, and then a couple of folks said, at my place, all these vitals and appearance would trigger a sepsis alert, which, which, is, uh, which is right. So there you go. All right. Um, so let's go to that next slide and just sum up the case as we know it at the moment. So we've got it who's ill-appearing, confused, sustained tachycardia, as someone pointed out. Now his pressure has dropped to 85, okay, on that last screen. What's up with that? This, this is definitely is the trigger that this kid is sick. So remember, in your adults, 90 systolic in the setting of other evidence of illness is hypotension and should be concerning. In a kid, it's even more concerning. So we tachycardia, hypotension. And if you're not convinced, it's going to be fun at some point here to talk about what the shock index is. So if you just measure a heart rate over systolic blood pressure, you get the shock index and his is super high. So anyone out there that needs convincing that this kid is sick, just look at that number. And we and we think, wow, that's meaningfully ill. So let's just do a quick review. Um, any, any comments there before I review shock, Peter? Or yeah, David, Gary? David, go ahead. I want to make a quick point. One is I think it's important to get initial vital signs when you're, when you're running a case as a, as a paramedic. I think it's really important as well to repeat bottle signs. I, you know, if, especially if you have a longer transport. Uh, and the reason why is, is all of a sudden now everyone here on this, uh, on this learning experience should be concerned, right? Because vital signs are changing. We now see a lower blood pressure and we're also tracking the child's mental status. And if there's anything that should be creating anxiety for those of you that are on this call should be that first point ill-appearing and confused. When a, when a child develops altered mental status, that's when my heart rate goes up a little bit. Yeah, and then that's a great comment. And then uh, Mark, um, a lot of people ask about the shock index, and I know you have a couple of slides on yep. this, but um, this is really a, a great number. Why? Why in kids is the shock index particularly helpful? Well, I think as I pointed out that heart rate is your is the, is the main way I, a, a kid compensates for their cardiac output or improves their cardiac output. And the, and the shock index allows you to take that into account. So it, it, it takes into account the combination of things that your body is using to try to pump more blood cells around, namely the amount of times the heart beats and the blood pressure it generates. So let's just zip to this really quick. It's originally a trauma measure, adult trauma measure, meaning at over 0.9, there's a prediction that that patient who's bleeding is going to need a bunch of blood and is really sick. Interestingly, in adult sepsis, a, a level of over 0.7 is predictive of mortality. And over here on the right, you'll see most of us sitting in our chairs right now probably have a, a heart rate somewhere around 60 and a blood pressure, hopefully around 120, which gives us a shock index of 0 0.5. That's normal. Our patient um, in the last uh, video I showed you had a 121 heart rate over point over 88, which is 1.4, super, super high predicts something bad is going to happen. If we don't intervene, there have been attempts to normalize this number for pediatrics. Um, again, in the trauma literature, we're going to have a, a document for you on the web uh, soon after the show with some of these references for you to, to go back to, if you'd like. Now, Mark, yeah. I'm going to ask you a question here. Yep. I'm going to push your buttons a little bit. Yeah. Um, many, many people who talk about sepsis will say, yeah, you know what? We have three to six hours to, to get this all figured out. 
Um, what do you say about that? Well, we're going to get into some fluid resuscitation talking talk in a minute, but I'd say these numbers should further push us toward urgent action when we see shock and sepsis, Peter. So if, if particularly with hypotension, there's no time to wait. Even without hypotension, look at this number at the bottom here, 88. Yeah, no, no big deal in an adult if it's 88. Well, maybe it is a big deal because their heart rate's high. They're trying to compensate. Their shock index is high. That patient needs more urgent uh, shock reversal and, and resolution than in three hours. It needs it in minutes. Right. And, um, I, and, I, and I, I asked you that question because one of the things I do want to talk about is everyone saw the room. Everyone saw all the clinicians in the room. And, you know, the question is, is where is your sense of urgency right now with that child? Yep. And how, and say you meaning everyone listening here today, whether you're in the pre-hospital, whether you're in the ICU or in the emergency department, because I want, you know, everyone to understand, as David mentioned, that you have the altered level of consciousness, you have the hypotension, you have the tachycardia and the tachypnea, you know, all of our hearts start racing. And the question is, what is the speed which we can now move or are, or are allowed to move versus do I feel like I'm being held back by some certain restriction guideline or paper that I read last week? And that, right. that's kind of what I wanted to mention. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 Hey, I've got a couple of questions on, on pediatric specific uh, shock index. Again, this is out of one or two papers. It's not anything that exists uh, rock solid in the literature. You'll have that paper available, but um, obviously kids' heart rates are higher at baseline. So the shock index is going to change at normal. So the max normals that have been um, tested um, in a couple of studies are in a younger kids, 1.2 being the top, 6 to 12, 1, and over 12 years of age, 0. 0.7 to 0. 0.9 is probably a reasonable high end. In any case, our patient, even prior to his hypotensive episode, was at 1.4 and, uh, and is um, notably ill. Um, James, let's just pop to the uh, shock slide and just remind ourselves what we're talking about. All shock is, is not getting enough red cells containing oxygen to the tissues. So demand exceeds supply. And that's usually because the cardiac output, the amount of volume the heart's squeezing out per minute is not enough to meet the body's needs, which is how children compensate. They just try to squeeze more fast out and get more blood out to the body. Shock then leads to death of tissue. So things start becoming injured and dying when they're not getting oxygen, namely the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the lungs. And if not reversed, we cause permanent injury or death if we don't address it quickly. A quick reminder on what causes this. What do we encounter that causes shock? Three big things. It's the tank, the pipes, and the pump is a great way to think about it. The tank is the total volume of blood we have circulating around. If someone's had a ton of diarrhea, hasn't drunk in three days, or is bleeding, they have hypovolemic shock. Distributive shock is when the pipes, the vessels, suddenly get bigger. And so the, the volume within, it, within which we distribute that blood is a lot larger than the volume that exists within it. And so we have to pump that blood around a lot faster to get enough to the tissues. And that is sepsis, as we'll talk about MISC, anaphylaxis, and spinal shock are classic examples of distributive shock. And then cardiogenic, where our heart squeeze is not strong enough. So an MI, for example, myocarditis, uh, a PE, anything that limits the ability of the heart to pump forward. And interestingly, on the next one, you'll see that sepsis, which by which I've noted here back, a picture of bacteria or MISC, the virus on the right, are overlap syndromes. You have all these playing a role at once, distributive, hypovolemic, and cardiogenic. And so it's going to have implications for how we treat these patients. Hey, Lastly, Mark, Mark, yeah, Matt, go ahead. Matt is asking, is respiratory failure a type of shock? Such a good question, because if you think about hypoxemia being or inadequate O2 delivery uh, being um, the, the hallmark of shock, then respiratory failure with hypoxemia is a contributor. It's not classically thought of as a cause of shock. It often goes along with it. We want to often manage respiratory drive and take that away from the patient in severe shock so that their metabolic demands are lower and we can provide more oxygen, but it's not technically in most uh, literature you read um, considered shock, though it's a contributor. So good Good question. Really good question. All right, let's keep going. 
One, one quick question. Uh, some some emergency docs are, get concerned about cardiogenic shock. Oh, yes. Concerned about overloading yep. with fluid. And how do you how do you play that in, or how do you think about it as a critical care physician? Yep. Once fluids when when with cardi if it's purely cardiogenic shock, you could actually overwhelm a patient with. Yep. And this is why people have become scared about MISC in which we know there's cardiac injury and sepsis and uh, things like myocarditis. Interestingly, uh, I'll show you a way we look at that is we use ultrasound at the bedside, which is something that is coming to, to the pre-hospital world as a quick assessment of that and should be coming. And I love to teach. Um, so but Mark, the data, yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, and I, I can't wait to see those ultrasound videos, but Let's say that you're in one of my systems where I don't have ultrasound right now. Um, you know, I think that are there ways of just by physical exam, yep. right? Um, and of course that reassessment issue. So I think that as we're talking about that, I mean, maybe as you show those other slides yep. later, we, we ought to talk about that because yep. I think that's a huge point that David brings but up. But I will say, interestingly, it. David, that the data in adult sepsis are that even in patients with cardiogenic or with, with, with depressed heart function pre-existing or as a part of their sepsis, they still do better with earlier proper volume resuscitation than patients who don't get it. So they, they have less respiratory failure and less intubation, less ICU stay if their shock is reversed early. It has to be done carefully. We don't want to just willy-nilly throw in lots of fluids, but a carefully titrated fluid boluses meaning 500 to a liter in adults or 20 per kilo in a kid and with frequent reassessment are, the, are essential when you don't have any objective measure of how their heart is doing. So great question. Um, why don't we you know, drop to that next one real quick. I know we're running short on time. We wanna get on to the rest of the case. Just a reminder, kids compensate for, for shock by increasing their heart rate. That's why it's most important. So that yellow line is the heart rate cranking up higher and higher and higher to beat more, to beat more often and pump more blood to the body, even while the blood pressure remains stable. That's compensated shock, okay? That's where we wanna intervene. As the blood pressure begins to fall, we're then really, really in trouble. That child is about to fall off a cliff and be hard to bring back, especially the younger children. So we do not wanna wait till hypotension to intervene with our therapies of fluid, depressors, oxygen, all the basics. Um, so just remember, compensated shock is where we want to intervene. So, so Mark, I think that's what I, you know, um, I've loved lately using the word, that the, the term, the Goldilocks zone. You know, obviously, if, if you wait till the kid is hypotensive, and God knows I've been there, where the kid's been in my ED for four hours, and then the mom comes running out of the room and says, hey, you better come in here. And I realize I've been sitting on a kid that's been, been compensating for quite a while, but because of the other umpteen children I just saw with gastro who were tachycardic, I said, it's just gastro tachycardia or they're just upset, what have you. And so, you know, why is it, and I'm, this is kind of a, uh, a little question for everybody here, but, and, and there's data showing this, that why is it that uh, even in EMS studies, that only 3% of children who are in shock are even treated with fluids. Like why, why are we missing this? This is the key right here is this is what people miss is that compensated patient um, without kind of understanding that they're about to go off a cliff. Right. Well, even those, they, uh, Peter, even the, even adult patients with, with hypotension get very little fluid pre-hospital. It's, it's hard to do. There's confusion about it. There's the worry that David brought up that we might, oh my, cause some hypoxia. Whereas the shock reversal is the primary goal. If it's given in a, in a measured way, fairly quickly, so that we can see if there's a result or not. And then we either continue or we stop based on the results. So I think that's the approach we should be taking. Um, good, good, man, there's so much to discuss here. Why don't we um, go back to, let's go on to that next uh, image of us given fluid here, uh, James. So we can get on to the next part of the case. So okay. no, not that one, the, uh, just the still before it. Okay. So we faced with a child with hypotension now, and we, we decide we want to give a fluid bolus. This could again be in the ambulance. It could be in the ED. And Peter, why don't you talk through what's happening here? What was done initially? And then, and then when we realized, wow, it's not working, what we go to next. Yeah. So listen, I've been doing this for uh, over 20 years now, and I can tell you that when I see the number is 999, I, I still get the chills. <laughs> so if you could see that, that left image, 
And you can see that uh, IV fluids are running into this kid in 999. All of us do this. All of us have done this. And um, when, if, if we want to back it up to what we do in, in, in EMS, where we don't have this type of equipment, uh, we would do the, it's, the, it's the equivalent of a pressure bag or a squeeze the bag or, or that type of thing. And that 999 typically will end up getting the fluids in, but in a, in a much longer time frame. So, Peter, can, Peter, can yeah. you tell us what 999 represents since we don't know what pumps are? Those of us who work, don't work. Yes, yeah. right, right, right. Sorry. So, so basically you have to tell the pump how many CCs you want to put in per hour. So we all know that the bag comes as a thousand mLs and the, the, the little keypad and the, and the, the window, the highest number it goes to is like, if you're playing the lottery and there's only three numbers, you can only pick, you know, the highest you can go to is 999. So it's basically a thousand cc's an hour, meaning that this, this big kid here, who's basically an adult, right, um, is getting a liter over an hour when he is, you know, in, in a state along that continuum of shock somewhere. And so, yeah, go ahead, Mark. So James, go straight to slide 21 and we'll just show what happened with this. Can okay? I just mention one, one quick- Yeah, go ahead, David. Mark and Peter, can you go back to that previous slide, James? Yeah. The children, okay, so, uh, the children four the children minutes. Of color. Uh, go ahead, David. But my question is: Is children of color, uh, Latina or or Black, African American? What are the challenges that we face as clinicians with just recognizing the physical exam findings of shock? We also know that children of color uh, show up to uh, emergency care late or delayed because of sometimes social circumstances. Uh, but from a from a from an exam standpoint, what are the challenges and what are the easiest ways for us to recognize shock in in patients of color? Peter, you want to try first? Well, I mean, uh, well, I, I thought you were you were opening it up to the group, but yeah. So, yeah. I, um, yes, I, I will say that especially in South Florida, we have that big issue, especially with certain cultures, right? Uh, and, and even so much to the point, at point this morning at 5 a.m., I got woken up by a family who culturally didn't blend with our culture. And it was like, you know, over the phone trying to get this guy to figure out that his dad is in shock, essentially. Um, and so what we do now in my emergency department is that in triage, we are, start, we are keen to look for those patients and to, if they're just sitting in the waiting room, sitting there, we'll go up and, and, and address them. We will, uh, from the clinical, from the physical exam point of view, you're right, um, you know, after looking for things like capillary refill, uh, looking at the, uh, the conjunctiva of the eyes is another one that we do. Um, but, and, and again, the altered mental status is another one, but that, that's not just, uh, that, that, that could be for anybody. Um, but we, we, we really do have more difficulty with certain patients than others. I would love to hear what everyone else thinks. Yeah. Hey, a couple comments coming in on that. Our cap refill is our number one detector in all kids. And that's right. So a slow cap refill is a worrisome sign in this patient. Interestingly, this child with a hyperinflammatory shock probably had what we call warm shock, where they actually have, may have bounding pulses, wide pulse pressure, and a brisk cap refill initially. So his hands are red, bright and red, but a child with septic shock further progressed may have uh, pallor, and that may be harder to detect in a kid with dark skin, which is to, to David's point. Flash, someone said, I've been told flash cap refill is worse. I don't know if it is or not. Toxic shock, MISC may look that way. It's worth just noting if that capillary is flash and refill is flash and the blood pressure is low, we do have warm shock. We need to put those two things together. Can you um, what do you mean by flash? Cap so what I mean is if you look all of you right now, if you take your index finger and squish it between your other thumb and, and index finger, you'll see the blood come back into your finger in about two seconds. Okay. If that takes longer and the white thumbprint stays on your finger or on the palm of your hand, then you have difficulty getting enough blood to the capillaries. That's slow cap refill. If it comes back in a millisecond, that's flash cap refill. That's someone who's hot bounding pulses high heart rate, they still may be hypotensive, but they're gonna have flash cap refill. Thank you. All right, let's go to that number 21, James, real quick. Don't play the video yet. And um, we're just gonna reassess where we are. This child then got the leader on the 999. Wasn't the wrong thing to do necessarily. He was just mildly hypotensive at, start, at the start. But look, after this, 
his heart rate's come down a little bit. Ah, that's an improvement. But wait, the blood pressure is still 88. We haven't gotten any better. The shock index is still high. What are we going to do now? What does Powell's interestingly tell us to do in this case, in this situation? Because we're thinking of sepsis. We didn't know at this time, May 2020, what MISC even was. So slide 22, James, um, we see what Powell's teaches us. And Peter, do you want to just uh, quickly run over this? We're going to we're getting tight on time, so let's do yeah. it do it quickly. Yeah. So since 2015, and this is based on a 2011 paper. Uh, done where children in septic, or I should say children in sub-Saharan Africa who, who weren't really septic, but they had dengue fever or malaria, they were found to have done better without fluids. But in that situation, it was dengue, malaria, which we don't really see here. Those children didn't have access to, uh, you know, a ventilator, didn't have access to an ICU. And so unfortunately in 2015, PALS overlaid that kind of thought process onto the US-based PALS guidelines, and they ended up using words, you know, um, you know, I have to deal with lawyers and what I do every day, they ended up wordsmithing it and use the word is reasonable. I don't know about you guys, David and Mark, but I got a lot of phone calls trying to understand what, what does that mean it is reasonable to give kids who are in shock fluids. So here's where I think part of the, and this is why I asked you the question earlier, Mark, which is I have a sense that because of some of the wording here, that people have been very cautious about thinking about fluids, whereas I think all of us on this call would say, let's turn that upside down and give more fluids early so that we don't end up days later with Correct. letting these kids. Correct. So not only is it reasonable, it's essential, but yeah. in a tailored way where we're paying attention, we're giving it fast and we're watching the response. So that's what they ended up trying to do here. Larry did down in his ER with this patient. So they realized, wait a minute, a liter over an hour didn't work. The kid's still hypotensive, still tachycardic. Things are getting worse. We've got a bunch of labs back that show he's sick. So let's go to the next slide, Peter. You can talk people through that. This is the video, James. One, one point I want to make. If, if, if yep. the patient shows up just like this and, and in the, in the pre-hospital setting, IV access is difficult to obtain is this child a candidate with altered mental status for an IO? Absolutely. And we should do an entire podcast on this very topic, which we'll save for later. How to do it, when to do it, how to make it not hurt, how to think about the need for IO access is a brilliant topic. We'll go ahead and put that on the next agenda. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. That, that's a great, great point. And then, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on Mark here a little bit because as a disclosure, we use... Mark's product. So um, we're happy to have a video of this. So we, we use this through our helicopter system and in our hospital system. Um, but you'll see here now how we have been, been doing this very successfully for a couple of years now. We will now give fluids quickly, of course, with good reevaluation. So James, if you wouldn't mind playing this video, uh, this is Dr. Malik's nurses uh, in Alabama now uh, giving fluids to this patient. Okay. Well, while we're waiting, Mark, can you can we use your product in the IO environment? Um, what I can say is it, it has been used a lot in the IO. It's not officially um, designated for that. There's no reason not to. Um, Here we go. Uh, specifically, but it's not officially indicated for that. So Peter, why don't you talk through this? Yeah, yeah. So, so every time she squeezes, she's giving 10 mLs. What, what, what people don't realize and what I, what I realized early on is that when you're doing push-pull, which is what we used to do, we are in, introducing bacteria into that syringe um, and that's been shown in research studies. But this is a way that literally within, I think, I think we hear him say within four minutes, he just got in a whole liter of fluid. Um, Can James pop to that next uh, monitor? There you go. Oh. So now, now Mark, so th th this, this is interesting, right? So now we just gave that liter of fluid and tell me what ha what's happening here because there are some people on the call now who are saying the kid's in, in shock, decompensated shock. He's tachycardic, he's tachypnic, and now he's hypoxic. Yeah, did we, right? do, did we do harm by giving that fluid? Is that what you're asking? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm asking that because it's not just a harm, but will someone take the next step and just go right to RSI or DSI, whatever exactly. you use, and say, now let's intubate this child because I'm now going to presume yep. 
that I've just overloaded this kid. So James, pull up, pull up 29 and we'll, we'll discuss this really quick. So we gave the fluid, we fixed the blood pressure temporarily, but wait a minute, we think the SATs are low, we're just going to 29. And so we have this summary here. We got a kid with fever, ill appearance. We know his lactate's high now, it's three. Uh, his cardiac enzymes are elevated. He's got this x-ray and we've given now two liters, one fast, his blood pressure is better, but what do we do? What do we do with that hypoxemia? And the question is, have we made it worse? So every bit, every guideline that you'll look at in pediatric resuscitation indicates that we need to begin in the setting of shock, placing high flow nasal cannula on the child. And this kid, I think, went up to about four liters. But interestingly, if you'll, James, if you'll go to the next video, which is wait, 30. Wait, wait, wait. Can we, yep. can we talk about this x-ray? What, yeah, what absolutely. We, sure. I mean, I'm curious what you're interpretation of it is I, I the left costophrenic angle yep. looks blunted to me yep and this the do you want to talk a little bit about how you just what, what your thoughts are about this radiograph? this this one so if you guys and i know that in the pre-hospital world we're not interpreting a lot of x-rays but what we don't see is the left heart border it's gone it fades into the stomach and the diaphragm and the spleen that means there's a pneumonia down there most likely so not only does he have um we know in the retrospect, MISC, but in the moment we, we were thinking, or I think Dr. Mellick was thinking, this must be pneumonia with sepsis. He's tachypneic, he's a little hypoxemic. We don't see the left heart border. This is pneumonia, sure enough. And well, I think that was the could, could it be a sign of fluid overload? In other words, pulmonary edema. Could, uh, ultrasound's a better detector of that, but a focal infiltrate is less likely to be a sign of pulmonary edema than I diffuse. Saw. However, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw a wrench into, this, into all this because MISC is known to come weeks after the illness. It's, if you look at the data from the New England Journal, they say most of those kids had no respiratory issues at all, meaning they had no pneumonia, they weren't hypoxic whatsoever. So this, this one is tricky for me because if, I'm, if the kid's not coughing and the kid has an x-ray that's not like, yeah, I, I do see that that left, that left diaphragm is uh, um, obstructed there a little bit. You can't really see, it's, it's, not, it's not so clear. But knowing what I know about MISC, I'm thinking, is it really a pneumonia here? So th this is good. This is kind of an iffy x-ray for me. Right. And it does make us wonder about those sets. So James, what we'll do is go, to the, go ahead and go to the next video. So thankfully, we wait, just wait a couple minutes. And guess what? Those sats are 100 the blood pressure is up a little bit, the heart rate's down. So our fluid actually improved the perfusion enough to that pulse ox finger that I think we were misinterpreting that uh, hypoxemia. You want to talk about that, Peter? Yeah, well, I, I, I think people, need to, if people didn't recognize that pleth wave, that, that blue wave there, that's really nice. You can see that it's going along with the pulse. Um, that is a nice pleth wave. So make sure that when you're looking at, and, and James, maybe you can go back to the last, to the 85% one. So we could see the difference between the two. There, there you go. Very, very different. And you know, maybe it just wasn't registering. So make sure that a this this thing is reading well and understand the fluid aspect. Because remember, this thing is on his, on the kid's finger. Making sure that he's actually having enough perfusion for you to get the right number there. Yep. So this is a good good uh, good contrast. Of All right. In there. the interest of time, let's zip to the next one because we have an important topic to discuss here. So. The ch he then, over the next 10, 15 minutes, gets hypotensive again. And you can hear Dr. Malik saying, maybe softly, I just and gave I just, him a I just gave him, I just gave him a little pulse, 10 mics of pulse dose epi. Okay, so the pressure dropped, and now he's given and two just, readings, and now he gives pulse dose epi. Peter, what is that? Per, this is great. And uh, I, I got I to give a lot of kudos to Dr. Malik because he's like, he's rocking it here. But so I, I actually have it, I actually have it right in front of me here, and I want, I want everyone to understand very simply, all push dose pressure, or we, we call it different things, push dose epi, but essentially it's what we call a poor man's epi drip. And essentially it's how do you get just 10 micrograms at a time? So take a look at this graphic here. On the left-hand side, that's what we give for anaphylaxis. We give it IM. It's very highly concentrated. That's a thousand mics per ml. Then when you take the packaging out of this drug right here, this is cardiac arrest epi. This is one in 10,000 or a hundred mics per ml. That's still way too much to give someone through an IV who has a pulse. So what you gotta do is really make the iced tea more dilute and take this 100 mic per ml and make it down to 10 mics per ml, which is kind of what we would do in an, if it was an epi drip. So how do you do that quickly? So 
I'm gonna do it really quickly here. So I have my one in 10,000 full of 10 mLs. I have my three-way stopcock. I have it off to here. And what I'm gonna do real quick here using my son's Play-Doh cup is I'm gonna quickly empty out nine mLs of Epi. And someone's saying, why are you wasting nine mLs of Epi? Why? Because in, in EMS, we, we, we don't really have time too often to, to label these things and especially the flush syringe. So I'm gonna make sure that what I make stays in this, in the Brista Jet. So now I'm gonna hook up, uh, sorry here, I'm gonna hook up my saline flush and I'm going to now just squeeze away here and I'm filling it right back up with nine mLs. And voila, I have now exactly what Dr. Malik has in his hands, which is 10 mics per mL of epi one to a hundred thousand and i'm just going to give one ml at a time and that one ml mark and david as you know may last me a minute or up to 15 minutes but this is what i call a bridge and hopefully it's not a bridge to nowhere so let's let's throw it back to you on that I, yeah I, so I, david any, any comments out, mark before you say because artemis asked a great question and i would like to address it to peter how do you address the issue of the unwillingness of some providers unwilling to give rapid boluses. Peter, you must deal with this as a medical director for EMS agencies. Are we talking rapid boluses of IV fluids? Is that what he's probably talking about, you think? Looks like it. Or even under resuscitation. Like, how do you, how do you approach that? Right. Yeah. So I'm, I am a, a very firm believer. And actually, when I was at Children's of LA, um, uh, Alan Nager, who's my mentor out there, he did a study where, and I was part of it, where we did 50 cc's per kilo over an hour. And guess what we found? It worked great. <laughs> you can, who can believe, right? So, um, and he published that paper. But again, people are just worried about the fluids because of that random kid here and there. And they're out there who has okay. cardiogenic shock, like you had mentioned. But I think David, and, and I know Mark's about to show the video on the ultrasound, but it goes back to the point of your physical exam, uh, the kid's current state and your evaluation of that state. Um, and then your reassessment of that patient, right? So um, I think that that's how, how I would answer uh, Artemis uh, on that. Peter, quick question on how fast do you push that epi uh, spritzer? Uh, it, you know what, it, as fast as you can get one ml in. So basically you, you, you give it and then you can follow with a flush. This doesn't have to be like teetered in over a minute or something right. like that. You could just give it and, and, and essentially just remember that if you were an adult, a hundred kilo adult, and you were getting 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, essentially, you can give essentially um, one ml of this per minute in an adult. And, and this kid, yeah. right. So, right, so you could, like I did this in 30 seconds, you could do this in 30 seconds and essentially save this kid's life or an adult's life. Why? Because you don't have to worry about mixing this four mics per ml drip by putting a milligram into a 250 bag and watching it drip and no, 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 no. We, we can get to that. All right. As our next step. But Peter, that's kind of the answer there. Let's resolve this. And then we want to bring a family member in to talk about their experience with this case. So uh, let's go to the next video, um, James, slide 40. And so the decision was made. He's still hypotensive. He needed a pulse dose presser. We're going to give an epi drip. And in the meantime, another 500 mils of fluid for this next bout of hypotension. Okay. So they're going to administer 500. He times it. Dr. Malik times it actually. And you'll notice at the end of this video, we're gonna have some vital signs that will make everyone happy. Um, while the nurses are preparing the epi drip, okay? So heart rate's coming down as we watch. It was 116 before, it's 106. Epi drip getting calculated. And within a half an hour of the kid's uh, presentation, actually after that first leader, within half an hour, we have given 1,500 mils, a spritzer of epi, and start an epi drip, and here's your vitals. Heart rate of 90, blood pressure 114. How does that make you feel, Peter, when you see those numbers? Oh, man, I am like, you know, that big sigh of relief comes through. I can talk to the parents. They're at the bedside. They're holding his hand. And this is, a, this is like, you know, now remember, the game is not over yet, obviously. It's not. Right, but I'm feeling a lot better now. So you can stop that, James. So let me just give you a quick summary here of what ended up. Actually, go to the PALS 2020 uh, slide on 39. Um, when do we start pressers? Wow, that's a hard one. Actually, I got the wrong slide in there. Basically, there it is. Uh, 
In infants and children with fluid refractory septic shock, it's reasonable to use epi or no epi. It's too big a discussion to decide which one we're going to use right now. Epi was a very reasonable choice. But what is fluid refractory shock and how long do we have to figure that out? And I would, I would uh, submit that it's, you don't have long. We need to give 20, maybe 40 per kilo of fluid liter to two in an adult sized patient. And if they're still experiencing hypotension, it's time to move on to your uh, vasopressor infusion. And we should figure that out in minutes, not hours. Um, Peter, David, any comment there? And then we'll invite Hussan on. Yeah, the comment I'll make is that um, as I'm resuscitating somebody, I have my push pressure ready. ready. I have my epi drip ready. I'm not waiting for, for you know, the kid to go to the ICU. Um, I think that once kids you have shock, please get out the presser. Please be sure that you're ready to use it without embarrassment, without fear. All right. We promised, by the way, a quick summary of MISC. So before I invite Hussan on, because I know people want to know what it is, uh, let's go to 45. And what this child ended up having was multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. It's a, it's an immune reaction to a coronavirus exposure, maybe not even a coronavirus illness, but a six weeks after in kids under 21, those who have persistent fever, elevated inflammatory markers, um, evidence of severe illness. Most, many people on the, on the chat here said he was sick when I saw him from the door. You're right. When that, you have that ill appearing child with rash, red eyes, tachycardia, hypotension, in the set in, in, a, in a COVID environment with or without known exposure, it's worth thinking about. Um, most of these kids don't have a PCR positive. Most of them have IV, IG, G serology positive as evidence of past serology. It's like Kawasaki's, but there's more shock and they're older kids. And Mark, so, Mark I, I know that we're running short on time, but if people have to leave, we understand, but I, you have to go over those ultrasound slides because I think okay. that's, that's a huge, huge thing here. All right, Just let's do it. Point. So back to David's question, how do we know if the patient's in heart failure? Am I going to hurt with fluid? Or am I going to help? Will the patient tolerate fluid? Will they not? And there's a lot of controversy you can read all day. You can read for the rest of your lives on the controversies around the use of IVC ultrasound. But it is a window into the body that's easily obtainable. Any of you on the line can do this with the right equipment in the pre-hospital environment and see if that IVC is totally collapsed and the patient's in shock they need intravascular volume as their first line. So let's look at the next video. This is Dr. Mellick pulling out the, uh, pulling out this, the, the, the uh, ultrasound. And he sees that the IVC is collapsing. That big vessel you see on the left is collapsing down with every beat of the heart. And when the patient breathes, it collapses fully. And we can't hear the sound here, but what he says is that heart will, that body will tolerate more fluid. That's what, that's our next step. And that heart squeeze similarly is very strong. Okay. So this patient has decent heart function. Go to the next slide, James, the next video. All we're seeing inside the body is the biggest vessel supplying blood to the heart. And if it collapses with, when the patient breathes in and they're in shock, they will tolerate more volume resuscitation as the next line. That doesn't mean you don't need vasopressors. You need to be getting them ready. But Dr. Mellick assessed that that patient needed it. This patient, in, on the other hand, has heart failure and the IVC is big and dilated. So again, a topic for another day, but a simple assessment tool to reduce our fear that we might do harm by giving that fluid bolus. Peter or David? My, my, my comment here is that Ultrasound is changing the way we practice in the PZR, and it's it's going to need to be brought into the pre-hospital environment more it, and more. It, you're so right, and it is it's, thankfully it's such getting an there. essential tool, and we need to be giving it to paramedics on the front line to use to do exactly this to help us assess. Uh, so, so I'm going to do a humble brag for Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, who who has we 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 gave them ultrasound, and we gave it to our EMS captains, and we love it and highly recommend. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a cost to it, uh, but definitely there's no reason why pre-hospital professionals shouldn't use this amazing tool, especially that they're smaller, they're cheaper. Uh, and I heard Joseph Zalkin's going to pay for it for everybody. Thanks. That's guys. what I heard too. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, let's bring in Hussan, who I invited. So I had a patient much like the... Um, one described here in the video, actually my first MISC patient that we encountered at Wake Med, who was very similar in his illness and in the difficulty of recognizing what this was on a couple physician visits before he made it to the hospital. 
And I thought it'd be useful and helpful to all of us just to hear from a family perspective what it's like to deal with both COVID and MISC. So Hassan is the elder brother of our patient. He is the son of two um, folks who both got acute COVID back in May uh, when there was an outbreak in one of our local manufacturing plants and were in the ICU. And his dad both recovered. His dad is still suffering some of the long consequences of COVID, but his younger brother um, actually presented with MISC and was critically ill. And Hussan, I don't know if we can get you on here on video or whether you just want to come in by voice, but we would love to hear your just brief experience with what it was like to have the unknowns of what was going on with your brother and then uh, kind of witness the, the turnaround when, he, when we figured out what it was and he got treated. Good afternoon, all. This is Hussam. I would like to share our experience with uh, what happened with my brother. So he had like a fever of uh, 104, nonstop fever. We uh, took him to uh, Duke uh, Hospital here in Raleigh. And they basically got discharged with a fever with unknown reason. He tested negative for the COVID-19 and uh, his fever didn't stop. Like no matter what we gave him, it, his fever did not stop. So at one point it reached to 106 and we called uh, his doctor and they said, we have to take him to the ICU. So we did that and uh, he entered the hospital on his birthday and they start to give him all type of medication to get his uh, fever down, but it did not. And basically at one point, it was like 1 a.m. in the morning, his, I woke up in his room seeing the entire medical staff around him and they were trying basically to rescue him. They contacted Dr. Uh, Mark, big thanks for him. And he basically, uh, we, they rushed him to the hospital at night and they, uh, he gave him the medication. I do remember he gave him the IVIG and his condition start to improve. Like everything that happened on that day, it's something I can't forget. It's something that I will remember for my entire life for sure. And the gratitude for all the medical staff is like immense. That's cool. That's such a cool story. And how's he doing now, Hussan, your brother? I believe he is doing good. Yeah. Like we follow, follow up with uh, a heart doctor, cardiologist, right. and he is doing good. So the main worry in MISC is that it causes heart failure, back to David's question, and it actually does. So he had a um, very similar presentation, hypotension, needed a good bit of fluid, got on norepinephrine infusion, got him stabilized. And this was early, early in the course. And we thought, we thought, well, maybe this is MISC. And the, and the beautiful thing about this disease is once you start the IVIG and the steroids, they get better in hours. It's, it's like the, it's the most satisfying thing to treat. Once you know what it is, he got dramatically better, but the resuscitation phase was the same. He needed volume. We guided it by ultrasound. We started norepinephrine quickly. He was on high flow cannula at 15 liters, never had to be intubated did develop a modest heart failure later. Interestingly, these kids will get heart failure late days into the course. And in fact, the patient we presented um, in the videos here got worse heart failure, worse pulmonary edema in the subsequent days, was on a ventilator for several days, and he himself is also fully recovered. So the good news is with treatment, these kids do great, but we need to be able to recognize them in the field, in the ED, provide proper resuscitation with the right amount of fluid, vasopressors and oxygen early, and then IVIG and aspirin and steroids, and they'll all do, they'll do beautifully. There are some, there are some difficult outcomes, but the more we understand about this disease, the better the kids do. And it's fun to hear that Hussan's brother has fully recovered, and his parents, though his dad's still struggling, everyone has recovered from COVID. But it's kind of impactful to hear how this disease has infected an, an entire family. Any questions, Peter? Yeah, I want to, I want to comment a little bit here because, uh, and David brought up a great point about. Um, the connection with the family, the fact that you are connected with Hussan and his family and that, you know, uh, he's relating the story it is today. It, it's so important. And, and again, Mark, uh, kudos to you, but also Hussan, thank you for coming on today and, and telling the story because a lot of us kind of sometimes miss how important the interaction is with the medical team when you have a family member who's that sick. So can you, can you comment on when it was happening 
how did you feel like you were being communicated with at the moment? Because I think that's such an important topic for all of us to hear from you. Thank you for asking that. So it, it was just like a stressful days for me. And there was like a great communication with the medical staff. However, there was at that time a lot of unknowns. So there, there wasn't still yet the MIC at that time, I believe. So as far as I know, he was the first patient with that uh, case at WakeMed. And thank you for Dr. Mark. He kept like watching his uh, coronary arteries all the time. I, I know that. And it, it's just like stressful. Even like when he got discharged, the stress was still in my mind. I basically kept start reading every research paper about like Kawasaki and how it affects the coronary artery and this stuff. So it's yeah. hard to deal with it. Yeah. And thankfully he did great. And most kids with MISC now we know don't have coronary artery, artery disease, but we did get a question. Why heart failure in these kids? Why do they get depressed heart function? And this can scare you from the EM perspective when you see a patient like this and their troponin and their cardiac enzymes are high. Is this patient having an MI? Are they having ripper myocarditis, it's scary to see. But interestingly, um, what, whereas they do get kind of a diffuse cardiac injury from the inflammation, they don't typically get coronary artery uh, aneurysms like the Kawasaki's kids. And most of the time they completely resolve and heal again. Not always, but most of them get a lot better. So it's once you can dial down that inflammation with the steroids and IVIG, um, we didn't know this a year ago, but we know now that most of those kids are gonna recover. And, and, and what's interesting, the, 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 some slides that we didn't get to today, but are important. For those of you who are looking for now these MISC kids, the kids who are older than the age of six are the ones who get the sickest. When you look at the yep. New England Journal paper from, from New York's 99 patients, uh, you saw that basically a majority of those kids ended up in the ICU. A majority of them ended up on a ventilator. Almost all of them got pressors. Almost none of them had any pulmonary disease. Um, right. Th this is this is the article. You can scan this and get all the all the information on it. But just so you know that the older kids are sicker as opposed to Kawasaki's, where the kids never really got this sick, where they needed ventilators and pressors and all the other thing. So it's nice to see and hear what Mark says that they don't end up with the coronary aneurysms. Um, where in Kawasaki's, if you miss Kawasaki's, you end up in and you don't give the IVIG in that first 10 day window and the kid ends up with coronary aneurysms, you find yourself in a lawsuit. And I, I've seen that happen. Thank God it never happened to me. But I will tell you that um, this is why the IVIG is so important in Kawasaki's. But uh, thankfully, there is no long-term consequence, at least we're seeing yet in the MISC cases. So it's, a very, it's becoming a more distinct illness, even though people are linking the two things together, where there are many similarities. Uh, there are some important differences with age and severity and long-term outcomes. I, I wanna share one quick other story that just occurred to me with Hussan on the line, which is our how we interact with family when we ourselves are uncertain about what's going on. And I think David brought this up uh, before. We didn't know there was such a thing as MISC at that time, or we were beginning to hear about it and it was called something else. And we had in the middle of, we had just this that day as a team, my team had watched a, a webinar out of New York state on this new syndrome that people are seeing in kids. And Hussan's brother came in and in the middle of the night, I was like, could that be what that is? And I re went and rewatched the webinar in the middle of the ICU in the middle of the night and thought, that's what that is. And so even, even talks like we're giving right now, just sharing information on things as they evolve and as they develop are helpful. We're, one of our desires is that we help you guys as you go away from here, begin to recognize illness and kids in general, how to treat it, but also new concepts that we're coming across like MISC and be able to better recognize them. So I think being honest with Hussan, with Hussan's brother, I mean, with Hussan at the time, saying, we're not sure what this is. We think it's this, we're going to try this. And it was a partnership really with him. And he was managing both his ill parents at home and his ill brother in the hospital. It was a super stressful time for him. And we appreciate that. We just appreciate that partnership. Awesome. All right, well, well, guys, we got to, uh, we only made it 11 minutes past, which is amazing. I thought we'd be like- And we're hours. only halfway done with our topics here, Peter. Yeah, uh, listen, I, I personally say that there aren't two other people in the world that I would you know, want to treat my family members and you two guys, David and Mark, 
You guys are incredible, impressive people. Um, and then to our entire team of uh, Amy and Hillary and James and Dan and, and all of our teams uh, who took the time to put this together, we are you know, super excited to be able to, to do this. We would love to hear from you in the comments uh, if this worked for you guys. Uh, you know, we, but one thing before we go, can one person at least <laughs> unmute their microphone? Because the goal of this thing was like, we were like, thinking that people are going to come and start, you know, unmuting their mics. And like, I think his initials are Jay-Z. It's the one I'm hoping yeah, for. Yeah. Someone, <laughs> unmute, someone unmute your mic and give us a comment. I, I, can, meet, I can meet your challenge, Peter. <laughs> okay, do it. Do it, Joseph. You're, Let's go. You're, basi you're basically telling us to treat kids like adults, right? <laughs> yes. Yes, because adults play with Play-Doh while they're having a webinar. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Anybody else want to comment on any experiences they've had or questions with verbally audio? We're not doing any more chat. We're going to, we're going to. And, and I'll say before anyone answers, just as you have thoughts on what of this is helpful, what do you want to hear more of? How should we do it better? Please tell us. It's super fun. It's an incredible privilege to do this. Let's keep it up and we'll take, we'll take uh, feedback. I do have one question if I may. Yeah. Uh, and I, I sent this to Dr. Antevi recently, but as, uh, just interested in everybody else's opinion, but we're just reviewing some of our protocols and one of them that still exists in ours is use of IV calcium for septic shock refractory to fluid administration. Is that still a practical thing? I mean, what's the latest standard of care for calcium? Yep. So what I would say is there's probably not a role for empiric use of calcium refractory to fluid. I would say if you are given fluid, you're on vasopressors and you have a low ionized calcium, which is the kind we get on the iStat machine, which you're probably familiar with, then I'm using it. But it's not my empiric treatment of choice anywhere in the first top five to 10 things I'm doing initially, okay? So hypocalcemia is a bad thing. Ionized hypo hypocalcemia, and I'll use uh, uh, calcium chloride for that if it's low, but once they're on pressors. The one caveat is trauma patients losing a ton of blood who need blood transfusion we need to be super attentive to, to calcium because if you remember the blood that many folks are carrying forward now in their EMS vehicles is citrated. And so as we give a lot of blood in the field, that citrate binds calcium and will drop the calcium. So patients, trauma patients needing blood products need calcium uh, and sepsis probably lower down the list, but be checking it. And when they're on pressors, I would check it and give it if ne as necessary. Peter or David? 100% agree. Yeah, and, and, and there, there, there's data on that. So in other words, um, I think there's been some data that's showing that in some, in some cases you give the calcium and the patient gets a little worse because of the, uh, of, of, of the influx of calcium into the heart cell at the, at the moment. So uh, yeah, I would agree with you 100%. Yeah, so not empiric, but, it's, but it is important. Correct. Um, yeah. One, one person right. asked, is n tidal CO2 beneficial for MISC? It's beneficial for anyone in shock. That's DKA, sepsis, trauma, MISC. It's a super helpful marker. If it's low, we're thinking there's some acidosis because of poor perfusion and we need to figure out why. That, that'd be my point. Awesome. Hi, guys. I'm Katie Sultan from Boston Children's Hospital. Yay. Yay. And, um, I, uh, it's a great, uh, great review. We, we get a lot of referrals for the MSIC as well as we have a Kawasaki's team at the hospital. It's been there for a long time. So. Cool. We've adapted very quickly to this. And um, uh, for fluid resuscitation, uh, still a lot of hospitals don't get it, even us. And I get very frustrated with that fact. And um, Thank you. sadly, um, and for the, any hospital that can gra get hold of the, um, the life flow, I'm giving a little plug there, we, which we do not use because we're struggling to get people to want to take it or use it, but um, uh, I think it's a really incredible product that should be used. Wow, thank and, you. Um, we know and, your nurses liked it. And, <laughs> and, oh, yes. And um, infection control, it's a huge issue with infection, infection control to have that closed system. It's, um, it's, a hand, it's a handheld system. You can go to the, um, you know, any part department with it following transport this patient. It's cute, huge. There's no plugs, you know, no batteries, no plugs. Um, we are still, I am still struggling to get this at Boston Children's, sadly. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's a great product. And I know that they have a, it's a blood, you can administer blood through it also. But um, again, 
fluids is very important. Even at the children's hospital, they still struggle with, mm -hmm. you know, that fluid balance thing and everything. So, um, but yes, I think it's a great product. And if people can get it and use it, they absolutely should because it's, it's so easy to you. We haven't used our level one fluid resuscitation, um, level one one. And I think it's been a very long time. So we're still stuck with the hand push, pull, the connect, disconnect, and the pressure bag. And anyway. Kathleen, Kathleen like I mentioned before, Joseph Zalkin will pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kathleen. It's, uh, we are honored to have someone from Boston Children's on here. I have to say, it's so fun. So did you have any other comments for us on just the MISC because you had so much experience with it? Um, I, I think, um, you know, again, just being able to recognize it early and uh, is the key. And now with all your septic patients, um, because there's, you know, you test them, they've not tested, they've tested negative for COVID. I mean, I tested negative for COVID twice before I was even tested positive. So, you know, everyone you have to presume that they may have had an exposure. So you treat that, you treat your sepsis and all your um types of shock together too. You gotta yeah. be aware. So I think just kind of following that uh, awareness of uh, early recognition, which we do have um, some things in place in place for that early recognition of um, shock, you know, through vital signs and um, a little bit of the history. But again, this whole COVID has thrown a wrench in for everybody yeah. and you don't wanna miss it. Um, yep. Like you don't want to miss Kawasaki's and Kawasaki's can start early on, even a day five, day three, day five. So just sort of really, you got to be really aware because um, those are the things that you don't want to miss. And sepsis is one of those things. And, um, and again, you can have your different types of shock going on at the same time. Yes. So I think that's really important for people to, um, to kind of keep in their mind. It's, it's not always just one thing. We, Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I was saying we really appreciate this comment. Thank you for coming on the video. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it over to Hillary. She started us, she's gonna end us, and also Hillary let people know about the CEUs and so forth. So take it away, Hillary. Hey everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kathy, for talking like a Bostonian and dropping your R's. That was awesome. <laughs> We, uh, we really appreciate everybody's interactivity. Next time you join, you have to unmute yourself. It's just going to be <laughs> off. We're going to take away the chat. Peter wants to talk to you. He wants to hear your voice. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you to Mark, Peter, and David. Um, the amount of information was overwhelming, but thankfully you can go listen to it again or, or uh, watch it in slow-mo or uh, pause it when you want to. Thank you for, um, for showing that you truly care about what you're doing and for sharing it with the... Um, paramedics and the pre-hospital providers and the in-hospital providers. Um, it's really an incredible gift. And thank you um, to Hassam for the, the um, wonderful insight about uh, what it's like to be a family member. We can't forget about them. So um, once again, everyone, Real Emergency can be found on YouTube for the video. You can log into prodigyems.com for CAPSI credit. Um, we will absolutely find uh, or, or post the uh, contents of the chat, as well as the slides, as well as the presentation, so you can get back to it whenever you need. Thanks everyone. Look, look forward to seeing you on the next one, uh, whether it's IO or uh, fluid resuscitation or something else, um, treating kids like adults, we'll have it for you.